The first moment was when I was 19, I was visiting my sister in Boston and I walked into her apartment and she had a poster hanging on the wall of this painting called Girl with a Pearl Earring. And um, I had never seen it before. I'd never, didn't know it existed. And I just stood in front of it and went, wow, that is beautiful. The light on her face, her big wide eyes, the blue and the yellow, the fact it looks like she's just turned her head and her eyes follow you around the room. I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was so beautiful. And the next day, being the younger sister that I am, I copied my older sister and I went out and bought a copy of the poster for myself. And um, so that was the first big moment. And then I had that that poster with me everywhere I went. I came to London on for, with Oberlin. I brought the poster with me. Uh, I moved to London. I brought the poster with me. The poster is still up in my office and um, it was hanging everywhere I lived. So that was the first moment. And that was when I saw it was in 1982, I think, 1981, 1981. And then, um, uh, and then I saw it for real in the flesh in 1996, there was an exhibition, a Vermeer exhibition that was in Washington, DC, the National Gallery. And then it came over to The Hague and in Holland, and I went over for a weekend and saw saw the exhibition, saw the painting in the flesh for the first time. But you know, it was a victim of its own success because the the um, the exhibition was so crowded that I was looking at her like over the heads of a lot of other people, or I had like two seconds in front of her, and then I was shoved out of the way. And I thought I'm going to have to see this painting in another light some other time. Um, but I bought the exhibition catalog, and then about. 18 months later, uh, I was lying in bed one morning and um, I was just idly looking at the painting, the, cop the, the poster, and I suddenly thought, I wonder what the painter did to her to make her look like that. And it was a like a it was a light bulb moment. These don't happen very often, but it was absolutely wow. This is not a painting of a portrait of a girl. It's actually a portrait of a relationship. It's a portrait of what she feels about him and how he represents it. And then I thought, wow, I wonder who she was. And I looked up in the exhibition catalog I had, I read the, the, the entry and they have no idea who she was. They have no idea who any of the models, there are theories, is it his daughter? Um, the, a lot of the other paintings, I think this is the wife, this is a servant or whatever. And um, but they had no idea. And I thought, that's fantastic. They don't know. So that means I can make it up. And even better, they knew very little about Vermeer. So I could take the little tiny bit we knew, the 36 paintings we have, put those all together, look at the painting a whole lot, and come up with this story. And I, I came up with this story in about three days. I mean, it took me longer than that to write it, but it was a very quick process. I suppose all I had to go on was the painting and what we knew about Vermeer. And um, and I thought, okay, who is this girl? Is she a daughter? So I found out, I worked out what ages, when, when they thought it was painted, what ages his daughters would have been. And the oldest one would have been 12. And I looked at it and thought, hey, she's a little older than 12. And not only that, her mouth is open a little bit and it's very glistening. <laughs> And, and in Dutch painting of, the, of that time, mouth open suggested a kind of sexual availability. And I just thought, you know, father is not gonna paint his daughter like that. The other thing is that there's such an intimate look between them that she's looking at us or looking at him that I thought it, it's, I just don't think he would, this is a daughter looking at her father like that. This is something else. So if it's not the daughter, then who else would be in the house? Well, um, it could have been a neighbor or a neighbor's daughter, I suppose. Um, but I feel like there's a kind of intimacy there that comes of familiarity of somebody who's around. So I said, well, who else is in the house? Servants are in the house. Um, and we also know, we do know more or less that he painted, there's another painting called The Milkmaid of a Woman Pouring Milk. And they think that that's, a woman named Tanika, who is the was a servant, a named servant we know. And I thought, well, maybe maybe he painted the maybe there's another servant. I mean, he did have eleven kids in the end, huge household, um, lots of. It would have been very busy. They would have needed servants. 
And, uh, and then I thought, okay, it's just, if I put the servant in the household, that's a sensible, commonsensical step. So what's the next step to get her into the studio? Well, we know he had a lot of children and yet his paintings, there are no children in the paintings and they are very quiet. So if they're very quiet like that, how did he manage to carve out some quiet in that very chaotic household? Okay, maybe he said nobody could come into the into my studio. You know, no nobody. Oh well, the maid can come in to clean because it needs to be dusted and clean. How does she come into his studio? Well, he says, uh, he you know it's a it's a chaotic household with a lot of kids, so he had to set a boundary, and the boundary is nobody comes into the room. Uh, okay, the maid can come in to clean because they need a clean studio. So that gets her into the room with him and nobody else there. And that's the, um, that's the key is that they have time together. And, uh, and that's how I got her there. And based on just the very tiny bits that we know about them. And I, I always am grateful that so little is known about him because, you know, maybe if it had been written down, it's the baker's daughter, I never would have written the book, but because I had a clean slate, that's how I, that's why I was able to do what I did.